what I want to talk about is uh, some work that we've been doing over the past few years in the Chicago region to engage communities in climate action, both in the city and more broadly around the region. And I'm going to focus on community and ethnic cultures. And as an anthropologist, culture is important to us. Uh, and why those cultures matter in engaging in climate action. I'm going to quickly give an introduction to the model that we've been using for community-based climate action and then take you through one part of one project, since there's only 12 minutes to show you how it works. Some of you may have seen that upstairs there's a table. I put a lot of our materials up there. I have some in my bag here. All of everything I'm going to be talking about is available on our website because we do want to be sharing it. And the project I'm going to be talking about is a toolkit project. So the point was to produce tools to be used. Let's see. So the process that we use is one that is research to action. It includes five steps, which I'm going to take you through. So the first is conducting rapid research that is uh, under under that reveals relevant community assets and concerns. And oftentimes in the climate world, those concerns are referred to as co-benefits. We then assemble diverse partnerships in communities. So unlike in Connell's examples, we do uh, to give funding sometimes when we procure funding for communities to groups that are not uh, nonprofit. We then work with those groups to translate regional plans into community strategies, and then develop and implement community action projects, and then scale them up and out. And so they're all connected to these broader efforts that the partners we work with and the government agencies we work with and us ourselves are involved in for social and environmental change. And it's key that they are part of those projects, not separate from them. And that is part of the mechanism that we use for making sure that they're going to have impact beyond the, the garden or whatever it is itself. So I'm going to show you um, how some of this works. So for this particular work, since 2008, we have conducted nine community research studies. Um, we call it participatory action research in these different, I don't know how you press this little thing, but in all of these different communities around the city. So this is a map of the city of Chicago. And they're very diverse communities, very different from each other, not only geographically, but also um, ethnically and socioeconomically. Many of them are low-income communities of color. When we do our research as anthropologists, we look at a couple things. We Try, we take an asset-based approach. So we're looking at tangible assets, so active community organizations, libraries, entrepreneurs who are very invested in the community, citywide partnerships, things like uh, there's a lot of people in the community that have construction skills or gardening skills, high percentage of home ownership, those types of things. We also look at the intangible assets. So we look at, for example, a lot of home country traditions of reuse, gardening, water conservation. We look at awareness of climate change and where that awareness comes from, and we look at things like having a history of collaboration to address major challenges. Um, and this is important because this supports what John Krasnick was talking about and is a little bit different than what Connell was talking about. We find a lot of awareness of climate change, a lot of interest in it, and a lot of that comes from people's traditions, whether they're coming from the U.S. South or they're coming from places like Mexico, where there's a lot more awareness of things like resource conservation. And I think that challenges a lot of the polls also that we see. Um, we also identify community concerns that there is momentum already around. So things like access to healthy food, beautification, revitalizing cultural traditions that can become springboards to engagement in climate action work. We use a lot of creative methods um, that come out of visual anthropology, but also that come out of um, museum work and communicating science to the public. And a lot of them are, I, I try to be really creative here and use a word cloud to show the methodologies, because one of the things we use to present our findings is a word cloud. So you can see what some of them are. Um, we use these in addition to the traditional methods of interviewing, participant observation, um, focus groups. We focus as a museum a lot on material culture and people's relationship to their physical and natural environment. And what, part of the reason we use creative methods is because if you just go up to people and say, what do you think about climate change? They may say, I don't. But it doesn't mean that they don't do anything in their lives that relates to climate change, and it doesn't mean that they don't care about climate change. So the key is, how do you get to, and they might not, especially in an urban environment, think very much about their relationship to nature or even their relationship to the physical environment. 
But we start as anthropologists with the assumption that everybody has those relationships and everybody does things that tie them to their environment. And it is our job to figure out how to pull those relationships out. And we need to use creative methods to do that. So we focus a lot on collecting stories. We use a lot of visual tools and visual prompts. And we're um, looking for those embedded understandings and those embedded relationships. So now we're on to the um, project part. I want to um, give you one case study of a project that we have we procured funding for from Boeing to turn the research that we did into tools for community action projects and into actual community action projects focused on climate action. We worked with four of the communities where we did the research, and they're all listed here. Um, they all did very different types of projects. In Forest Glen, we worked with the Boy Scouts and the Chamber of Commerce, and the Scouts installed rain barrels, gardens, and bat boxes. In Bronzeville, which is kind of the African-American Harlem of Chicago, we worked with um, an a small entrepreneur who's doing economic development and a vegan soul food chef um, and some social service organizations as a partnership to do African-American gardens and healthy cooking and also green tours. In South Chicago, which is on the southeast side, where there's a big South Chicago retrofit project funded by the city, we did an outreach um, project with some environmental justice organizations and an art organization with youth groups um, creating a community-wide exhibit of green practices that also uh, advertised the South Chicago Retrofit Project. But what I'm going to focus on is the Pilsen Project now. The Pilsen Project was, it's a very uh, Latino neighborhood, mostly Mexican, that's also being gentrified and has become somewhat of an artist's enclave on the um, kind of near west side of the city, just outside the downtown. And we worked with them to uh, do a project that ended up focusing on creating a native play garden and an outdoor climate change education classroom. And the partnership is really interesting. It's an environmental justice organization called PERO. It's a daycare, and it's a Mexican hometown association that is part of a bigger hometown federation. So it was very diverse community partners. We also brought in technical assistance on landscape architecture, very contaminated lot and soil remediation. We brought in scale up or sustainability partners that are gonna help keep this project going by providing education and resources for unstructured outdoor play, which is something that the daycare, had, none of these organizations had ever done. And we, as a, we are seen very much as a neutral organization, as a scientific neutral organization, so we were able to facilitate all this and we have these connections. And even those three partners had not worked together very much until this project. So I want to just back up, and unlike Connell, I think part of the point of this is to show you the methodology. So I wanted to just back up and show you the research findings that this all led on. So in our research there, we uncovered these types of assets. You know, as I explained, environmental consciousness is central to Pilsen's Mexican culture through things that people told us about, like this Sierra Lake campaign that they knew from being in Mexico, which is a water conservation turn it off, it means. And it was apparently equivalent to the Got Milk campaign in the United States. Um, they're very, there's a lot of work um, around different types of concerns. Of course, immigration. There is a tradition of outdoor interactions, an active garden network. There's concern around lack of green space. It's one of the communities in the city that has the least amount of green space. Uh, there is coal-fired power plants there, thus the environmental justice focus. And there is a big focus on cultural identity. And we collected stories like this one above. A young staff person at this school said that neighborhood parents have been very supportive of the community garden that they installed and that they frequently mention their own close ties to the earth and to gardening. She also said the community garden has many other benefits, including a time for parents to talk to their children about some of the gardening practices that they have in Mexico. So that's an example of the types of stories we collect. So based on that, we put together this approach, and this is a, a diagram of how our approach works. We took the Chicago Climate Action Plan strategies. There's five of them. These are three that they identified as relevant to them. We took the Climate Action Plan for Nature, which was created by a conservation alliance in the Chicago area called Chicago Wilderness, and we created climate action, community action strategies for it. They did not exist. So we created five, and that's now one of the tools that we have that are available for people, because otherwise communities would have no idea what to do with it. And then we um, 
worked with the partners to identify community strengths and concerns that fit with some of those strategies. And out of that came this particular project. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so this is the project. It's the Mary Zapata Native Garden, an outdoor climate classroom. That's part of a sign that they put up. It went from that uh, vacant lot with contaminated soil and under this blue tarp is a car to uh, they did a lot of cleanup and that fit in with their environmental justice work and now it's this native plant play garden. And they never asked, by the way, for play structures. There are no play structures and it is all native plants with little hills for running on. Um, it's, got, it's an educational space. It's got a whole bunch of signage tying in all these different things. There's a focus on the monarch as, um, as wildlife that goes back and forth between Michoacan, where many of the people, this hometown association is focused on Michoacan, come back and forth just like the butterflies do. And so that's a way of talking about immigration and borders. Um, they're going to do workshops there on climate refugees. They're gonna, it's going to be part of an environmental justice tour that already exists. It's going to be a new stop. It's an integral part now of the daycare. Um, they're going to use it. They're going to be doing outreach to neighbors. And then it's part of a larger effort by a green garden network in the neighborhood to make Pilsen itself declared a monarch reserve. So the last thing I want to tell you about in my last minute, maybe, no last minute, Okay, I'll finish these slides very quickly, is um, we also created these regional climate science and action tools, and the goal of these was to take all of the research and what we learned from the research, which is basically that people do care about climate change, they don't know what it has to do with Chicago or their lives, and they don't know what to do about it, and really present the basics of climate change in terms of the Chicago region, and very visually in easy to understand ways, and also in pictures that look like them. And so we created all of these different tools, comic books, Windy City in the World, uh, videos. This is an example of one of those tools and the different types of things that we tried to point out. You know, like why is there a big snowstorm and how is that indicative of climate change? We tried to go from the polar bear to a local indicator species, which is the um, Heinz Emerald dragonfly. And we tried to tie it into things like people's home country cultures. And that is, and then we did a lot of scale up, which I'd be happy to talk about later. So these are some of the other things that it resulted in, in addition to this climate project. And this is the website. There's a temporary site up right now, but it'll be a, a full website in March. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.